or so as a church journeying through the narrative of the Bible. When we started this series, we talked about the components of a, a, a good story, whether that, that story is, is fiction, whether that story uh, is true, that there are some components of a good story. We talked about the reality that the good stories have a compelling introduction. They prepare you for what's coming. Good stories, they present a challenge or a problem that needs to be overcome. They involve character development. They might involve subplots that, that make you ask questions or, or dig a little deeper and say, what's going on here? They're relatable, so there's something that you can, you can pull away from what you, you hear, or what you see, or what you read. And they usually involve some sort of redemption. We've journeyed from the, the birth of creation to the wandering of God's people, from the establishment of, of Israel as a kingdom to its destruction, from the exile to the return. We saw this cycle where, where God creates, where God longs to be in relationship with God's people, and God's people fall short, which leads to judgment and pain, and, and God gathers up a remnant and shows grace. And all of that pointed toward Jesus, to his birth, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And then over the last few weeks, we've explored the earliest days of the church, how it grew and took shape, how it, it had various challenges that it had to overcome as it learned how to exist in a changing world with a variety of cultures. Significant stories, they, they usually also include a powerful conclusion. And that's exactly what we, we get with the book of Revelation. Jesus told his apostles that he would come again, but, but we're not told in the gospels how it all would look. And then we get to John's vision here. And what a vision it is. <laughs> parts of it are, are terrifying. Other parts of it are assuring. But for the most part, for a lot of us, it's just confusing. Can I get an amen? Yeah. This morning, I'm hoping we can clear up a, a little bit of that confusion, and I'm, I'm also hoping that we ultimately see that, that Revelation is a reminder that God is always at work, redeeming creation and making things new. The Revelation is reminding us that God is always at work, redeeming things and making them new. As we dive in, will you please join me in prayer? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your story and for the journey we've been on over the last year or so. God, as we open up our Bibles, we ask that you give us ears to hear what you have for us. And Lord, I ask that you would take my words and use them for your kingdom. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So picking up at John, or sorry, picking up with John's vision in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother who share with you in Jesus the persecution in the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyteria, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining with full force. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. 
I was dead and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what it is, and what it is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This again is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have any of you ever had one of those, those dreams where you wake up and you're not so sure that you were just dreaming or if what you were dreaming was real? Any, any of you, you? I used to have this dream. I used to have this recurring dream that started a, a few years into college where I would wake up terrified that I was one class short of graduating from high school. And you would think, oh, well, yeah, yeah, right after high school when you're in college, that makes sense. But it continued for like 10 or 15 years where I, w I kept waking up thinking, oh, I never graduated high school. And then I'd have to talk myself down. I'd, I'd wake up and, and kind of have to talk myself down and say, no, you graduated from college, which means you went to high school. You went to seminary, which means you graduated from college. You know, I'd kind of have to talk myself out of, no, no, you were just, you were just dreaming. When I had kids, that dream stopped. I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure why. Revelation kind of reminds me of one of those dreams. It, it kind of reminds me, I, I imagine that when, when John kind of wrote down this vision and finished, he had this moment where he thought, what in the world just happened? What, what is this? What's, what's, what's going on? One of the, the reasons we're, we're often so hesitant to open up Revelation is because it's just bizarre. It's, it's just hard to make sense of it all. Even some of the greatest theological minds, people like John Calvin and Martin Luther, they shied away from studying it. John Calvin got to, got to this point, he opened up his, wrote prolifically about every book of the Bible, got to Revelation, said, nope, I don't get it. I'm not going to write anything about it. I, I, I can't understand it. It's so easy to get kind of caught up in the symbolism, and we, we have for years, get caught up in the symbolism of every little thing that happens, and in the middle of, of looking for deep meaning to every single word, sometimes we miss the story that's found in Revelation. And when you step back for a moment, and you look at the type of work that, that it is, the type of book that it is, its genre, the history of everything that was going on. It might not clarify everything, but it, at least it gets a, a little less confusing. Most believe that Revelation was written about 50 or, or 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. The, the early church had grown, it had, had begun spreading in, in both number and, and influence, and the growth made the rest of the known world a little uncomfortable that, that this growth had been taking place. So, so leaders in the church, like John, they were exiled to a small group of islands in the Aegean Sea by the Roman government, and, and John was banished to an island called Patmos, which is about 10 miles uh, long and, and six miles wide and in the middle there's kind of this this bay that pulls it together it's it's made up mostly of volcanic rock and, and the highest peaks about a thousand feet high you can you can kind of look out and see the other islands that are around you and you so you you imagine that John has this vision he's banished to this island and he has this vision where, where he can see what's happening on other islands where, where he can see the the beautiful Greek islands that are around there. And, and he's, he's banished on this volcanic island. Whenever I picture John on Patmos, uh, some of you may have seen this movie, but I, I can't help but see Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway. Do any of you know that movie where he, where he talks to Wilson, the, the volleyball? I, I can't help but picture John as, as Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway. Being there would have been a bit maddening for him. There would have been a feeling of, of hopelessness. And like what we read in the rest of the Bible, it's in the middle of hopelessness that, that Jesus tends to show up. In the middle of when someone is feeling hopeless. Uh, first and, and foremost, we, we need to know that the Revelation is a, is a vision 
Revelation is a vision. It's about something that, that Jesus reveals to his angels that is passed down to John, which is then passed along to the churches, which is now passed along to us. One of the reasons the revelation is so confusing is it's, it's hard sometimes to decipher who is speaking to whom as, as we're reading through it. But if we follow a framework of something being passed along from God to the angels to the seven churches down, down to us, some of that confusion begins to be cleared up. Revelation is, is also a witness. It's John's personal testimony of what he saw and what he experienced. He wants to share that with the world, and he shares that with the world through the form of a letter. It's addressed to seven churches in Asia, really what we, we call Western Turkey today, most of whom needed some sort of, of course correction, most of whom needed some sort of, of hey, you need to get in line. But, but it's also addressed to the church in general, to the larger church. He wanted to describe how discipleship actually looked which mostly involves setting aside selfish desires for the sake of God's kingdom, even if it meant martyrdom. We can almost think of Revelation in the, in the same light, almost, as we think of Paul's letters to the churches in places like Ephesus and, and, and Corinth. He's directing, or addressing, excuse me, a, a specific issue in a specific culture. But his words, in the same way that we read Ephesians and Corinthians, are meant for us in the church now and today as well. Revelation, it's, it's also a prophecy. This is where it gets kind of, kind of muddy, as you, you have all of these different genres written into one work. So we see similarities to, to prophetic books from the Hebrew scriptures. We're gonna talk about this in the middle, in a minute. Like Isaiah, Ezekiel, and, and Daniel, that we, we see similarities to it. John grew up with those prophecies. So the images that we read about and, and, and see, we, we should hear some, some huh, that, that sounds familiar. But typically we read them and we say, oh, not going there. Not going there, not, not opening that. But, but if you think about the images that we read about in Ezekiel and in the Old Testament and Daniel in the Old Testament, they sound familiar. And, and lastly, it's a proclamation. More like the Gospels are a proclamation. So is Revelation. It's a proclamation about who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus is going to be in the future. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus had already accomplished God's purpose in his death and resurrection. We're reminded that, that God's purpose was, was to come and to say, God loves all of creation, and because of that, Jesus is coming. That's the, the, the incarnation. So that had already taken place, but, but Revelation proclaims that God will continue to fill that purpose, that God continues to work to remind us that we are loved, to draw us near to God's self. So if we wanted to um, summarize Revelation, we could say it's a prophetic letter describing John's vision that proclaims who God was and is and will be in the future. It's a prophetic letter describing John's vision that proclaims who God was and is and, and will be in the future. We're promised that God will continue to do what God has always done, gathering broken people, redeeming them, and creating something new. Along the way we get, we get to be a part of that redemptive work in the church today. But the big difference that we see with Revelation is that it doesn't just stop with what we are doing today. We're also given a glimpse of what God will continue to do into the future until the work is complete. In the introduction of Revelation that we, we read this morning, John hears a voice that's, that's like a loud trumpet or, or like the sound of, of roaring waters. It gets his attention, so he, he turns around and he sees seven lampstands. And in those lampstands, there's a figure standing in, in the middle 
Now, I know we often think of, of Revelation as this big, scary book, but it's not always that, that, that scary. The, the seven lampstands, what do they represent? The seven churches. The, this is a, a children's song. This little light of mine. He turns around and, 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 and he sees the church. The seven churches with the lampstand shining. It's not always scary. Revelation's not always scary. And in the middle of the seven churches is Jesus, the Son of Man, standing there. The church then, the seven churches that he wrote to, they had a task. The same task that we have today, to let our light shine out into the world. The beginning of Revelation is a reminder to share Christ with the world. It's a call to not sit around waiting, but, but to be active, to participate with God's redemptive work today. And the Son of Man, as, as the Son of Man stands in the middle of the shining lights, we're, we're told that his face shines brightly, that he's got white hair, and that he's got bronzed feet, which I always thought is kind of a funny feature. He's got a sword for a tongue and is holding seven stars in his right hand. And John tells us that the stars represent the angels or the messengers to the seven churches. Now, if you read this description in a vacuum without reading any other part of the Bible, it is crazy. If this was the first part of the Bible that you were to ever read, you'd say, this is nuts. But if you read it in light of the rest of Scripture, it's, it's not quite as crazy if you put it next to, to Matthew 17, where Peter, James, and John, they go, they go up a mountain and witness a transfigured Jesus and have to hide their face because of how bright it is, it doesn't sound so crazy. If you put it next to Isaiah 6, where Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on a throne wearing a long robe surrounded by singing seraphs with wings, it doesn't sound so crazy. Even the term that, that John uses to describe Jesus here, the Son of Man, is familiar. All four Gospels record Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man, but, but it goes back even further than that. In Daniel chapter 7, we see a, a messianic title used for a vision that Daniel has for the Son of Man coming and conquering four earthly beasts. Revelation might seem odd, it might make us uncomfortable with some things, but, but it's important that we see that this sort of genre, literary genre, is, is there, is present throughout Scripture. This sort of language is present throughout Scripture. The vision of Jesus is an extension, this vision of Jesus is an extension of, of the picture that we're given throughout the rest of the Bible. But it also looks a little different. It also looks a little different. One of my, my favorite stories about Jesus comes from, from Luke chapter 5. And I think it, it helps to connect the dots between the, the, the picture that we're painted of, of, of Jesus in the, in the Gospels and the picture that we see of the Son of Man here in Revelation. Peter is out fishing. Most of us have heard this story, right? Peter's out fishing. And he fishes all night with his fishermen colleagues. And he doesn't catch anything. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Go and, go and fish again. But this time, throw your net on the other side of the boat, see what happens. And he, and he does it, and he catches so many fish that his net breaks. And his response is, Jesus, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. Go away from me. Now, if I encountered the Jesus of Revelation that we just read about, that would be my response too. <laughs> go, go away from me. But we see that Jesus in the Gospels as well. This, oh, I can't, I can't take it. It's, it's, it's too much. I have questions. It's, it's too much. I'm in awe and I have questions and I'm, I'm sitting in this uncomfortable tension. But, but I'm, I'm here. And what does Jesus respond to Peter in that, in that boat? Don't be afraid. Come closer. It's the same response that the Son of Man has to John at the beginning of Revelation. Don't be afraid. Don't look away. Sit in this tension. 
sit in this tension. And John goes on to write down what he sees. And yes, it's terrifying. But it's also awe-inspiring. It's also full of hope. It's also full of redemption. I once read that with Jesus' incarnation, with, with God being born, becoming a man, dwelling in our midst, in the person of Jesus, what we read about the Gospels, really what we've journeyed through with the story, all of that in Jesus' incarnation, in Jesus' incarnation, we're given a, a temporary peek into the permanent collision of heaven and earth. With Jesus' incarnation, we're given a temporary look into the permanent collision of heaven and earth. And then when we turn to Revelation, we see a vivid image painted of how that collision goes on for eternity. So after John describes Jesus in the beginning of Revelation, after he begins to write down what, what the Son of Man tells him to write down, the letter to go to the seven churches, we, we read about these epic back and forth battles in Revelation. One that goes back and forth that includes horsemen and, and warriors and creatures and, and, and dragons. I, I haven't been watch, watching the show, um, but tonight is the, the series finale, finale of Game of Thrones. And, and you could read Revelation and you can say, huh, they're not original. There's dragons, there's monsters, there's all these beings, there's all these, it, right, right there in Revelation. And, and, and where I think we get in trouble with, with Revelation is we begin, we begin debating over who might represent whom, of, of where we're talking about Rome or other political leaders or, or where we might be talking about something bigger or what's the timing of this vision? When's it, when's it all going to take place? It's so easy to get caught up in those debates. And there's a place for those debates. There's a, a place, I should say, for those, those conversations. It is important that we take scripture seriously that we study it, that we search for answers. But sometimes, I also think it's important to just accept what we read. To, to read it and say, oh, wow. We need to pay attention to, to the genre while acknowledging the difficulties and, and then say, okay, what does this mean for how we live today? I don't believe Revelation is meant to just strike fear into our hearts or else the Son of Man wouldn't start what he says to John with, fear not, don't be afraid. I don't believe that Revelation is just meant to scare us. I actually think John intends it to be the opposite. That it's there to give us a hope for what's coming. We see that in the beginning of the letter as Jesus tells John not to be afraid and, and prepares us for what we're about to read. But we also see it at the very end of the letter. Revelation paints a picture of a, a redeemed future. I want to invite you to do something a little bit different this morning. I want to invite you to, to close your eyes and to listen to these words of Revelation 21. Hear these words. Just let them, let them kind of sit with you. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among, among mortals. He will dwell with them as I their God. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, see, I am making things new. It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega. The beginning in the end. Gracious God, we, we thank you for the reminder that you are constantly at work making things new.
drawing your creation back to yourself to remind us that we are loved, to give us hope, to remind us that we've been redeemed. And God, we thank you for continuing to work out your story in our lives. We ask that you would continue to do so. We pray these things in your name. Amen.